Thank you very much. Um, right, this next session um, is called For Profit Providers, Will They Fundamentally Change Our Sector? Answer, yes, let's all go home. Um, well, we have actually some really interesting panelists uh, to talk to you, and they're going to each speak briefly, and then we'll have a discussion. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll introduce them as we go along, because you'll, you'll, you, won't, you'll, you'll, you won't remember um, if, I, if I do them in a big, big long list. But first of all, we're going to hear from the Chief Executive of United Communities. She became Chief Executive in April 2013 after serving as BCHF's CEO. Um, and she has a long and illustrious CV, which I won't read out right now. Um, but she's an expert. So please welcome <laughs> Una Goldsworthy. I, I think we're not supposed to trust experts anymore, are we? So I'm not sure about that. Um, I think I'm on a panel which I might be slightly in the minority. Um, and I think my point is, and the reason I'm here is, because I have experience over the last 18 months of working in the sphere of for pro two for-profit providers, and my experience has been quite different. And I think that's the point, really. There isn't any one set form about how um, we might work with for-profits. The first one when, was when we were working with a local authority on a large section 106, quite complicated. We've been working with the local authority for about uh, 18 months, and then right at the end of the process, when we were just about to, we thought, we thought just about to do the deal, uh, along comes the for-profit providers and um, we get blown out of the water. So I guess that was a rather unfortunate experience. And my second experience was a more positive one, um, where we worked right from the beginning uh, with Shemez and Cheney on a very um, complicated, complex project on the edge of Bristol, which is 160 homes, six different tenures. Uh, we've set up a, uh, an SPV. We've worked very much in partnership. And at the end of the day, as well as the uh, market-rented and discounted market-rented housing, we have social-rented housing, and we will manage the whole of the state when it's finished. And I see that as very much a partnership. So I think my point is, I don't think there's just one model. Um, there isn't just one type of for-profit providers, but we need to be quite cautious, I think, as a sector because of that diversity. So recent experience around some of the smaller um, providers that have come into the market charging maximum rents, quite unscrupulous, I know are causing the regulators quite some concern. And then I think my other point really is about the additionality. So some of the larger providers, for-profit providers who are coming along, um, who Really, what we all want is to build as many homes as we can. It's about additionality. And where it's additionality, I have no problem. But when it's coming in and bidding up the prices, where the only people at the end of the day who gain from that are the developers, I have some concerns about that. And I think it should be about additionality. And perhaps the basics of it, and we can talk about this later, is, is it the same? Are we driven by the same mission? Is there that social mission sitting behind the for-profit? Which means, as Theresa May was telling us all yesterday, is why we are held in high regard by government, because we're in those communities for the long term. So I think we have to be quite careful and protect what we've been doing for, for, for over 150 years in some communities, and really think, are we talking about a different, a different type of provider, and therefore regulate and deal with it in a different way? Thank you very much. Um, next, let's hear, well, let's get a bit of a legal perspective. Rob Bailey is a partner at uh, Trowers and Hamlin's Housing and Regeneration Department. He advises local authorities, RPs, and charities on a broad range of projects. So, Rob, what's your perspective? Okay, thank you. Well, um, I've had the pleasure of, of working for a number of the new entrants to the sector over the last year, uh, including legal in general. Um, and it's my personal view that this uh, change, this entrance of, of, of new entrants to the sector, has the potential to be as profound an impact on the sector as the introduction of private finance back in 1988. And I think that every organization that's represented in, in this room and, and across the, the conference across the summer is going to be impacted one way or another. Um, we have um, every client that I've spoken to, situations where, rather like UNA, the new entrants have been uh, up against them in terms of bidding for Section 106 sites. Um, and I think there are some profound questions that boards have got to answer in relation to new supply if the new entrants are going to be taking on existing Section 106 opportunities. The scale of this is absolutely staggering. Mm. Um, Legal and General have got a business plan which assumes two to 3,000 units per year. 
Um, we've got Sage, which have got a business plan to get up to 30,000 mm -hmm. units uh, within three or four years. And all of the evidence that we are seeing on the ground is that both of those organizations are on target to meet those objectives, if not exceed them. So the wall of new capital which is coming into the sector is real, it is happening, and I think that the, the boards need to address that and, in my mind, work with this rather than trying to fight against it. Thank you very much indeed. Um, next, let's hear from the head of housing at Savills, Robert Grundy. Hello there, thank you very much. Um, for me, this is all about ethics and additionality. Um, we have to get the ethics right, and we have to ensure that there's uh, additionality. What, what I think we need to recognize is that parts of the sector are beginning to find themselves at their limits of gearing, or they're approaching their limits of gearing. So what we have here is a new source of capital, and a very, very big source of capital. So in terms of the big picture, I think it's a great thing that affordable housing is capable of attracting uh, capital from a different source. Um, to my mind, um, uh, it, is, it is a slightly a kind of curate's egg kind of thing. Providing that the business plan is soundly based, and particularly that we've got direct investment into assets, then I think there's, and, and taking rental risk and other risk, then I think that this is a very, very positive development. I'm not so keen, I have to say, on some lease-based artificial covenant-backed approaches, which is basically just playing the game of, uh, of believing that the regulator will step in to sort things out. Um, I think we've got, we've got the potential to release capital um, through the purchase of existing stock and also through the purchase of Section 106, and we've seen Sage in particular being very, very successful. And as Theresa May was saying yesterday, that the capital that would have been used to acquire Section 106 needs to be deployed in terms of housing associations doing more development. Bluntly, I don't think housing associations do do enough development. They have the skills and capability to development at scale, and I think that this is what they should be doing. There are also opportunities for them to manage uh, and, and to, to uh, lever their businesses by collaborating with the new sources of capital. I think. I think we also need to recognize that this is not going to go away. There's a huge quantity of capital out there that sees this as a very interesting area uh, to invest in with alignment of interest with affordable and social housing. And I would finally question the NAP Fed uh, as to whether it shouldn't really be thinking about inviting the for-profit providers to become a class of membership subject to an ethics test or some kind of test about the kind of a whole approach to management and so on. But I think this is something that the NAPFED shouldn't be turning its back on. I'm deliberately winding you up there, <laughs> but I'd, I'd be w welcome comments on that. Thank you very much. Um, Shamez Alibi is a partner at Chain Capital and portfolio manager of the Social Property Impact Fund. That's a fund that has delivered housing for families with low incomes, key workers, the elderly and the disabled. Yeah, I guess I'm, 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 as a private sector participant, I, I'm going to try and shoot myself in the foot. Um, and what I mean by that is we're all looking for additionality. We all want more homes, whether that's um, um, developed by housing associations or for-profit players. But I think we have to be careful. All for-profit money is not the same. We have seen deregulation in other jurisdictions We've seen it in Germany, we've seen it in the Netherlands, we've seen it in the US, where you have had the large players, um, you know, the large private equity-backed players participate. And some of the outcomes, the social outcomes, have not been what one would expect from the sector. It's not one that the sector would be proud of if looking at those outcomes. And so I think we have to be very careful when we talk about, you know, this is releasing capital. But we have to think about how is this stock going to be managed over five years, 10 years, 20, 50 years? And is that ethic, and I think that's a great word, Rob, that you picked. I use the word intentionality or social impact. How is that social impact embedded in that capital? It is not good enough simply to say, I am buying 106s that allow the sector to build more homes. That's not good enough. I think you really have to have a social <coughs> impact perspective if you are a private capital player. 
and that needs to be embedded in the DNA, and I think, well, I agree with Rob, the NatFed should allow us in, but it should allow us in at the price of admission is that we are held, our feet are held close to the fire. Mm. I think the regulator needs to do a lot more to hold <laughs> uh, our feet close to the fire. Um, we have seen some missteps already with private capital. You know, uh, if we rewind 18 months ago, people were talking about, isn't it great that you have all these REITs who have entered the market and are helping supported housing? And that was a slow motion train wreck um, or derailment. Um, luckily, I think it's been stopped. But private capital for the sake of private capital is not the answer. We should be very cautious when, about the capital, what is its values, what is its intentionality, and what is its objective. And so that's my view on, on, on for-profit. Okay, um, let's hear a slightly different perspective, I suspect. Uh, from Merrick Cox, who's a managing partner at Asprey Group. So I'm clearly the bad guy of the group then. Uh, <laughs> so Asp Asprey is a social impact fund. We, um, we were set up about a year ago. Uh, and in, in six weeks went out to institutions and raised about eight billion, at which point we sat back and went, I'm not quite sure I know what to do with all this money. Um, I think it's important to distinguish between providers of funding uh, and, and how things are managed. We don't manage any properties ourselves at all. I mean, last year, I think we've done about 200 million uh, to date, and we've got about 220 million in our pipeline. What we do is we uh, effectively try to help pension funds who are managing, 80% of them are managing council pensions um, and insurance companies, so the very longest classes of capital. So pension funds look at 25, 30 year horizons, uh, insurance companies typically about the same 20 to 25 year horizons. Help them find long term yielding assets that have got low risk, a lot of protection in them, uh, that give them confidence that the pension obligations they have to meet. Uh, are something they can do over the course of a very long period, long after the people who've done the deal typically um, are no longer work, working there, in fact, may even be benefiting from that pension themselves. So we bring that, that source of money to the sector. Um, I don't personally feel any, any sort of embarrassment that, that for profit is, is a dirty word, which it sort of seems to be seen as a bit. Um, every person in this room, I suspect, has a pension, and if the people who are investing your money in your pension don't manage to make any money, you're going to have a bit of a sorry pension. Ditto, we all probably have cars and houses we insure, and those policies need to be based on returns, um, and we're helping those people provide safe, stable, long-term returns uh, for those pension funds, for those insurance policies. So that in itself is a fairly serious social uh, good in, in, in terms of providing those returns. And how do we impact the sector? I guess we would see it as what we can really bring is an awful lot more money Everybody knows there's a social housing crisis. Nowhere near enough is being built. Um, we can go into what's stopping that happening if, if people want to later. But money is absolutely not a constraint. And, and I don't see a problem with the ethics side of what we're doing either. So I've set myself up. <laughs> <laughs> and do, do you think, I mean, obviously, there's been, a, there's been a, an argument over whether uh, a for-profit can be a housing association. Do you think they can? So we're not a housing association. We, we uh, will either fund houses that, so we'll either take existing assets that the housing association owns, uh, release capital for them, they will continue managing them, or we will build new, new stock for housing associations or councils. We've done both, um, and they will manage those. So we don't manage stock ourselves at all. Right. Um, I have some questions on Slido. Um, I can also take questions on the floor, so please do put your hands up uh, if you'd like to, to, to get involved. Um, the, the one at the top at the moment is, how should non-profits developing housing associations respond if the result is a reduction in their traditional S106 opportunities? Who'd like to take that? Shall I give that yeah. a go to start with? Um, I think the first thing, and I think the first fundamental thing I would say, and it, it picks up a point that, that Una made, is you've got to be very careful of a sector that you don't get dragged into a bidding war, because uh, that doesn't do anybody any favors. And in my mind, the competition from for profits for Section 106 units, it's merely a continuum of something that's happened in the sector for as long as I've been practicing. Um, I remember talking to a chief executive of a housing association out in East Anglia 20 years ago, bemoaning the fact that he was getting outbid for Section 106 units by London-based housing associations. So let's not pretend that there's nothing new here. This has always happened. 
but associations need to be prepared to understand what is the maximum price that they will pay for a scheme and then stick to that. And if that means that actually their pipeline of Section 106 stock stops, then the boards have got to ask that question, well, what do we do with our capital instead? And in my mind, that feeds right back to the conversation that the Prime Minister led yesterday, which is much more land-led development, genuine development, community-led development, um, rather than simply relying on a pipe flow from developers. Una? Um, I mean, my, my association, we haven't um, focused mu much on Section 106 because they don't offer very good value for money, to be honest, in, in the west of England. So we've sort of taken ourselves away from that, co that competition and moved much towards land-led. But then the reality is, it is the Section 106s that have delivered at that speed over the last few years, 10 years or more. So as a sector, we have to therefore adjust and build up to have those skills and the resources to do that land-led. And speaking from bitter experience, it is slow and it is difficult. And it does not deliver very quickly. And there's quite a high failure rate in that as well. So it's about the sector understanding that that shift away. And fundamentally, why, why, why can't the, the for-profits look at investing in that new supply rather than trying to increase developer profit? I just don't see the, the, the argument for that. It doesn't... Let's look at new supply. That's, that, that would help the for-profits, I think, gain a particular niche. Mary? Oh. I'm going to be slightly contentious here, which I guess is going to be why I put on the panel. I don't understand how a for-profit company, which needs to make profit, can end up bidding more than a company that doesn't need to make profit. That's when? economically illogical. So I sort of start from the mm. question of, of for-profit turning up and outbidding not-for-profit organisations is oxymoronic. That either means there's an efficiency difference or something of that nature, or something going on which, it, which is not endemic in that question. I, I, think, I think you've got it completely wrong. <laughs> I'm, it's, it, you know, they're funding, if, if some of the large players are backed by large private equity backed operators, they have very good funding relationships. I know some of the people that we've talked about today, before they even bought a home, they've already started speaking to the big investment banks about issuing a triple-A rated bond issuance. I mean, let's not be naive. The public sector, the for-profit markets with leverage or without leverage can compete with housing associations. I think we have to move away from this idea also that housing associations, the only role they have is capital. You know, our work with Una and with Tony Stacy, we could not have done what we did in Sheffield or in Bristol without Una and Tony's local community contacts, their relationships with the local community, their relationships with the council. So I think, you know, as associations see pressure and, and are going to get squeezed by some of the large private equity-backed sponsors on the 106s, they need to be thinking about what can they deliver to people like Merrick and myself in terms of things like community engagement. You know, we don't manage and maintain either. Our relationship with Una is a great one in which we both have a share of the assets on the estate, on the development, but she's managing and maintaining our share of those assets. So there is a role that Una has, and if we went to go off and do something else on another project, the first person I'm going to call is Una to see if she wants to manage and maintain those units. So I think housing associations can diversify and use their existing strengths, which is their connections to the community, their relationships with the council, and their existing business model to grow and not necessarily just look at section, the diminishment of Section 106 as, a, uh, as the end of their business. Do you want to just come back? I'm not, sure, I'm not sure I should disagree in particular. <laughs> I, we we yeah. don't manage anything, so we'll always work with the Housing Association. Well, what, you, what you fundamentally disagree on is, is whether there's going to be a bidding up process or not. And you, no, you're, no, you're I, saying there I, won't I be. Think it's bringing, saying I, think, I think what we do bring is capital efficiency to the sector. So you know, we're, we're good at axing them. I, you know, I ran a hundred billion funds, so I know where to find money. Um, but that, that's, that shouldn't mean, you know, if I've got to make a profit out of that, someone who doesn't have to make a profit out of that on top of that should be able to bid more than me. Well, the got you want to come in. Uh, well, I, I, I for a long time argued that um, housing associations are in a very thoroughly protected argument. And um, some of you may have seen my other line of mischievous questioning is, you know, why aren't housing associations open to hostile takeovers like commercial property companies are if they're not fully utilising their assets? And, and what we saw was that when the rent cuts came in, housing associations were able to, to generate and deliver very significant efficiencies. I think this is another wake-up call for the housing association sector to, to drive out more efficiencies, 
for them to look at themselves, look at all the areas of activity that, they get, that they're in, and to focus on those things that they are best at and to leave others to do other things and for other people to hoover up those activities and concentrate. Now, this isn't necessarily about scale. I'm not saying you've all got to merge. I'm saying you need to be very efficient. And I think the other, the other route is that you need to examine yourself and truly say, if by 106, buying 106 properties, are we actually creating more housing? And I, 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 I think you're just acting as a conduit of capital, truly. I don't think you're playing to your strengths. Housing associations should be out there creating new communities. If you look back to the history of housing associations, that's what they did in the first place, creating the place where communities thrive, being able to manage a whole range of different tenures, community building, uh, and, 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 and so on. And perhaps working in partnership to help that happen with other, um, other sources of uh, capital. And I think it also represents an opportunity for you to collaborate with capital coming into the market. You already collaborate with private capital through private finance. It's called debt. Here you could co-invest. <coughs> you could co-invest with equity, uh, which is what this is. And, st and it, you could still be delivering housing. You could still be the, the people managing it. You could be governing the relationship with the tenants. You could have the tenancies. So, uh, and I'm glad that Shimez is nodding his head to that. So, um, <laughs> well, I think it's an opportunity. Th there's a question, I think, probably aimed at you, Shimez. How, how do you suggest the test of whether a for-profit passes the test of having social impact as part of its DNA? Who should do this? The National Housing Federation is not a regulator. No, I, I, I think that's going to that's be one of the hardest challenges for the sector to come up with, which is how do you find out who do you want to work with? And it, I think it's going to have to be a commercial decision. And you're going to, if you are looking to partner with private capital, you know, you're going to have to ask those questions. For us, what we chose to do was um, we work with, before we do any investments, we work with um, New Philanthropy Capital to socially screen all our investments. Uh, they write to all our investors to tell them if we, they think our investments are socially responsible. And what I, we, what, what I took, when we did this, we, one of the things that I always comment on is just because you invest in student housing doesn't make you a student. Just because you invest in social housing doesn't make you social. So we have to be very careful that we can't, as a private investor, I can't say I'm socially responsible because I invested in some Section 106 almost or some social housing. I have to demonstrate what am I doing with the community, how am I working with the stakeholders, how am I taking a long-term view on the development. So that's what we do pre-investment. Post-investment, we use King's College. There's a wonderful social policy unit there run by Jennifer Rubin, and they go ahead and independently of us, they're paid by, for by our investors, go every year and screen our investments. They speak to our stakeholders. So Una will get a call in about a year's time to see how things are going. They speak to the local community to see how, how are they enjoying our homes. And that kind of transparency of social outcome and social impact is very much embedded. And that's what, you know, when I met Una, that was, I, I, you know, I hope Una realized or, or saw that early on, that we are just as committed to outcomes, social outcomes, as we are to, to financial outcomes. Rob, I mean, should there be a test? I think it's for the sector to decide whether or not it wants a test, and, and certainly some of the conversations I've had with some of the new entrants to the market, they're open for a conversation about a, a code of conduct, a, a code of practice. Um, wouldn't it be great, in my mind, if the NHF got behind that? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't be bad for business either, would it? Um, <laughs> yeah, um, you know. can, can I just say something around... Um, we, in our rules, most housing associations, not-for-profits, have something around to helping people alleviate poverty or necessitous circumstances. So that's absolutely written into our social mission. It isn't about extracting shareholder value. We don't have to do that. So there are decisions that we make that are really not good business decisions. So, for example, housing somebody like we've just done this week, who's just come out of care, never had 18, never had their own home before, they could fail, and we could end up with having to put a lot of support in. Or they could fly and be really successful. We don't vet the people that we get largely. We will house nearly everybody that we're asked to house. And those are decisions that are based in our social mission. We very rarely evict people. 
we try to charge the rents that are the lowest that we can possibly charge, rather than maxing out in terms of the 80% on affordable. And that's something I think we broadly share mostly within the sector. So it's about having that power and that um, uh, ability to be able to think broader than just that shareholder value. And fantastic if you can, absolutely amazing, but that's my concern, that the experience when we've looked at private equity coming into things like mm. children's homes or into um, schools yeah. or into um, uh, care homes like Southern Cross, they're about extracting value and they haven't always stayed the course. So I have got that concern. Mm. I, th I think Una raises some very good points there. I, th I think you've raised some absolutely on, on the button points there. <clears throat> and this is why I think that the, the business plan and the, the method of operation that the entity is choosing to adopt, have, ha, it, it, it has to be very clear, carefully ver verified and checked. And so, you know, we've got Fiona and Jonathan sitting in the audience there from the regulator. Um, they're having a bit of a laugh with each other, but I think there is, there is a very real opportunity for the regulator to get involved in this, to understand both the business plan, the approach to financing. You know, you might, you might, you, you know, the example you gave there, Perhaps they were a little overgeared, you know, the way that they're, uh, they, you know, they were mm. pushing the finance too hard, and that, mm. that's what made it fall over. Mm. The, ethics, the ethical side of it, I'm sure that the regulator of social housing could, could come up with a test uh, and, and to look at the, whether or not the business plan was soundly based. What we have to remember is that the sector went through a similar kind of thing 30 years ago with stock transfer, when, when local authority stock was transferred from local authorities into housing associations, mm. uh, the, 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 uh, it was, they were completely fully geared. There was a lot of risk sitting there, mm. and there was a lot of, but what we went through was a period of verification to make sure that the business plans were soundly based. And, and so I think the final point on this is that I think that what we mustn't forget is that it's just as damaging for many investors, pension funds and the like, if one of their investments is not performing ethically, it has very, very real impact on shareholders Absolutely. and their perception of the organization. Mm -hmm. And it costs real money mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the, the share price of the investor. Uh, so the, the blowback from not behaving ethically for some of these investors could be very significant. Can I just pick up on a, a point that Una made about the housing of the vulnerable? Um, I think we've got to be slightly careful as a sector that we don't get seen as, as being in our own ivory tower because, mm. as some of you know, I've, I've got a, a big practice working for local authorities. One of the biggest bugbears from local authorities that I've had over the last five years are housing associations turning their backs on the most vulnerable, um, housing only who they need to house uh, in order to bring the rent through the door. So let's not pretend that the sector is perfect in housing everybody that's in need of a house. I'd also just add, I mean, I think the most important social good we can do is providing enough housing. There is a huge housing shortage in this country at the moment. Mm -hmm. And yeah. whatever we've been doing to date has not provided the housing we need. If you live in a bed and breakfast and can't choose when you eat, can't, can't have a sitting room to go to, you're stuck in a single room, that's pretty awful. I'd say a pretty major social mm -hmm. good is providing a house for that person. Mm -hmm. That's what we're setting out to do, and we'd regard that as a pretty good thing. Mm -hmm. I'd echo Robert's point, you know, our... Our LPs, you know, if if they're seen to act unethically, they will lose the funds they're managing, and it's pretty pretty bad for them. Absolutely. So we have no incentive to act in an ethical manner whatsoever. Mm. Anyone wants to come in and speak? Yes, there's a hand right at the back. Just just wait for the microphone to you. Um, Ian Cole, uh, South Yorkshire Housing Association. We're working very well with uh, uh, Shamez on the chain in development, but that is an ethical uh, investment as far as we're concerned. I pick up the issue of shareholder value and how far the emphasis on shareholder value can mean that the tail starts to wag the dog. Uh, in my day job uh, as Professor of Housing, we been doing work on major developers. Shareholder um, proportion of profits going to uh, dividend payments has increased from 7% in 2010 to 50% in 2017. And you might think that's wound back into things such as pensions and insurance, but it's also leakage out of the industry. And my concern would be precisely the same trend would take place from softly, softly in the earlier years to something a bit harsher a few years down the line. Mm. 
Could I, Laurie, the, the reason why the proportion that's been paid out in dividends has gone up is because the profits have gone down. Your, your implication behind that is that everyone's increasing their dividends. It's much, it's, it's much more the profitability issue. Not true, he says. We'll disagree on that. <laughs> um, anyone else while we're on this? Yes? No, it's right, it's right by you. Um, how tough is some green square? Should we not embrace the uh, full profit lot because they're going to pay more for these properties? And that means that we can then go back to the local authorities and say, stop giving in to the house builders' viabilities. You can actually, you know, we can produce more social housing yeah. because actually these guys are willing yeah. to pay top dollar. And as Una says, we'll go off and do the other yeah. stuff and build the communities yeah. by buying land and do that way. I think there's a, there's, there's a really valid point there, which actually the local planning authorities have, have got to step up to this, um, both in terms of making sure that they understand what they're getting into when, when they're putting Section 106 agreements together, that they're protecting the social good and, and actually you know, the, the, the risk of, of uh, social housing going out of the, the social housing sector is protected in the planning obligations, yeah. but absolutely properly interrogating viability. No. So, so that, that, that requires the, usually who is the preferred partner on the 106 is done after the planning and the section 106 is sorted. So you'd need to do that in parallel to make sure you capture that viability. Um, and too often what we see is that actually we, we as a sector are bidding against each other. So actually you should revisit it. So perhaps you, you need to look at the section 106 being a, a bit more flexible. So you revisit it at the point when the, 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 the section 106 um, uh, provider is actually sourced. And I think the other point um, is that that requires the planning authorities who are under enormous pressure at the moment to try to recruit staff and good staff yeah. to have those skills in-house that they can draft those Section 106 mm. agreements with the right clauses in place, particularly the mortgage in possession clauses, which is getting a bit techy really. Yeah. But those are the clauses that protect that social housing in perpetuity. We put them in because our funders are requiring it, but if you've got the possibility that that could leak out because of a failure of any um, private equity in the future, you've got to have those absolutely, absolutely watertight. Right. And my concern is that we probably, at the moment, haven't got those skills within those planning departments. So it requires a sort of a change, not just in terms of the regulate, regulation, but also into that front-end planning as well. Do you want to comment? No, I, I completely agree with you. Know, I think it's very academic. Can I, I think that's not how, how it, the planning system is. <laughs> could, could, could even to manage to think about it that way. We're so far away from that. Let's, um, let's just go back to um, the sent-in questions. How important is it that housing associations own the stock they manage? Or is separating property ownership and management a good, more efficient thing? Uh, I, I, it's a very good question. I, I'm not necessarily convinced that housing associations do have to own their stock. Um, I think it, it, it is important that housing associations are engaged in the management. I think that that, that, that is important because of the values that they have and the, um, uh, uh, the, the benefits that they bring to the residents. I think, I think what we've just got to remember is that the current approach to finance, it kind of is an apparition of ownership anyway because it's all about gearing and you've got, you've got you're working with a uh, a, a, a partner who is funding you through a mortgage. Here there are opportunities to work with a partner who is funding you through equity. It is just a different approach to finance. I think we've just got to make sure that the outcomes that happen are, are, are correct, that we have more affordable housing of the right quality of what we need, well managed, ethically managed. Um, and it's also about who takes that risk. So some of the models I've seen are, I've got no problem about owning. You need a certain amount of ownership in order to borrow to build more, so that's important. But I'd be quite happy about managing, and we are doing it with, with, with Shemez and Cheney. But it's also about um, uh, where that um, uh, equity c comes, comes out mm -hmm. to, because what we've got to make sure is that we... Um, that the, who takes that risk, and what some of the private equity models I've seen are passing all the risk onto the managing agent. Yeah, so all the things about rent collection, indexation of rents, um, any arrears, all those things being passed on. Yeah. If the equity provider and the investor keeps that risk, I think that we would probably be a lot more open to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think that when, when we deal with housing associations, I think the toughest bit for us is, is working with a housing association that understands those risks. We want those risks on the table so that you can then discuss them 
And I think it's even more subtle. I think Una's point about how are you going to manage the tendencies and are both parties speaking the same language mm -hmm. with respect to what's going to happen when that tenant is in arrears? How long, how are you going to behave? How are you going to select your tenants? And I think all of those things need to be discussed up front when working with private capital. And I would really encourage, if you are thinking of working with people like uh, Merrick and myself, is to bring those issues to the table, you know, force us to address them and make sure it's codified in the documentation as to how you want to manage that. And I think that, if you're going to, I think that is the basis for a successful relationship with respect, with private capital, is to get it codified, explore the details, the nuances, and then you have a sense of what you're getting into and a good sense of what risks each party is walking away with. And I think that, that's really, really important. I agree with Shemez. I mean, it's, it's, from our point of view, we don't have a fixed fixed perspective. We have to do this or that. We're not going to manage properties. It's not our skill base. As to who takes the risks, that's a pricing question. Mm. What, what doesn't work is, is, is saying, we want you to take all the risks we want, you know, whatever it is, 2% cost of money. Mm. It, you've got to price the risk accurately and work out who's taking which risk. And as Shemez says, document it very clearly. And then that's priced in terms of where that risk sits. I mean, just going forward, if, let's just suppose the economy doesn't perform incredibly well over the next few years, um, and private sector house building mm -hmm. goes into a slump, are, are you going to end up charging you know, high rates of interest uh, for all of this? Are you, you going to demand a big return as the only people who've got money to spend here? Mm. Um, I'm not sure that's how the markets work, actually, Chris. Um, the, the, if, if there's a slump and, and, and that in to tend to mean the stock market's going to go down... But you might be know, the only players in town it, as well. It, it, it's unlikely that the government's going to put interest rates up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So if you've got a slump, the government's going to try and prom promote how the economy can grow by keeping interest rates low. If we then start trying to say we're going to charge you know, a huge premium over, over where, where you know, government rates are, no one's, going to, no one's going to take any money off us. So, mm -hmm. I, I'd look at this sector as something where, if there is a slump, this is a more protected sector than private, private housing, and so people will want to put more money where there's more money going into it, the pricing goes down. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I think that's precisely why we're seeing this wall of capital coming into the sector at the moment, because um, the one thing that I think we could all agree on the panel is that there is an enormous mm -hmm. housing crisis that we all need to respond to. Um, so the demand for this stock is not going to go away, which is why it is now so attractive to the investment community coming in. I, I, I run a private fund in the States, a 100 billion fund, one of the largest funds in the world. We spend time trying to find tenths of basis points. You know, here you've got a sector where you've got property backed, some sort of inflation protection because rents generally go up over time with inflation, some sort of government protection because they're generally protected by you know, the rents you're going to get are coming from, from social commitments from the government. So a yield with that sort of protection behind it is immensely appealing to institutions. Mm -hmm. that, that's where this demand is coming from. But you know, when you're looking at 0.2% in gilts, if you can get you know, one, two, three, four, five points above, above that in, in, in this sector, if, it, if, the, if the market turns down, this is only going to become more attractive, not less attractive. I, I think it's going to depend on what's the for-profit model that people have chosen. Are you a, a Section 106 bidder? If you're a Section 106 bidder, your, your opportunity is going to dry up because house builders are going to pull yeah. back. If you're people like Merrick and myself yeah, who are looking at additionality and focus about building new building, actually it's a wonderful opportunity for us to deploy capital and take the space of the house builders who will pull back. So actually I think it's the house builders that will pull back in an area of softness and it's these kind of impactful driven social property models that can then deploy capital and take up that vacuum. So I actually think we can be counter-cyclical in, in, in a downturn as opposed to uh, the, the traditional housing model, which has a different form of capital. Just lastly, Mary, I mean, do you feel you're operating in sort of a, ho in a hostile environment? I mean, do you, you, know, do you feel, you know, you, you can't sort of set yourself up as the villain. You know, um, is that what you feel? I should, I should have a white cat, shouldn't I, sorry. The, the environment regards you as? Um, I, th I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about what for profit means. Um, I think people, you know, the point that actually this is investing pensions for people who work for councils mostly, and everybody around here has a house insurance policy and a car insurance policy. You know, profit is not a dirty word. If you don't make profits, it's difficult to reinvest in a thing. And whether you're a for-profit or a not-for-profit provider, you know, a not-for-profit provider has to make money so they can reinvest in their stock as well. So I think it's a misunderstanding question more than anything else. We must leave it there. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.